Thank you, Jim. That was very kind, and good morning to all of you. You know that that third balcony is not structurally sound to hold people? <laughs> oh, shh. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have an overcapacity crowd, and I'm sorry for the hundred or so folks that are watching it uh, being broadcast in the uh, donor's room, but that speaks uh, well of the excitement about our city that we have an overflow crowd here. And this building, of course, is a testament to all that we have accomplished through our partnerships. And I want to take a moment and acknowledge some of the key individuals who are not only instrumental in making this building a reality, but have also been an integral partner as we shape our city and our region. Our city commissioners who are here in the front row, would you please stand and be acknowledged? Orange County Mayor Teresa Jacobs and our County Commissioners. And all of the other elected officials who are here this morning. I also want to recognize my wife Karen and son Trey who are here with us today as well as my other son Drew who is hopefully studying for finals at the University of Colorado. <laughs> I want to thank them for all of their love and their support that they give me that allows me to get up every morning and serve our community. <laughs> this building and the performers that we've seen this morning, and you knew I'd want to have a fiddle in the band, and the patrons who visit each and every day embody the success, the vibrancy, and the creativity we are seeing all across our city. Thanks to our world-class venues, Orlando can host any event and numerous events on the same day. Recently, on a single night, more than 80,000 people enjoyed everything downtown has to offer. People dined in our award-winning restaurants and toured our galleries. Lions fans cheered on Orlando City at the first Major League Soccer game. The Magic took on the Celtics at the Amway Center, and this building was filled for the Orlando Ballet's Battle of the Sexes. That night, our city was alive, and now that's the norm. And that night made it clear Orlando is one of the best cities in the world to call home. But all of this didn't happen by accident. We've developed a shared vision for our city, and we focused on creating partnerships to achieve this vision. At a time when state and federal governments are in gridlock, as evidenced by yesterday in Tallahassee, here in Central Florida, we're celebrating unprecedented achievements through strong collaborations that reach beyond partisan politics and create a unified community. It is through partnerships with our residents, our business community, our faith-based organizations, our arts groups, our tourism industry, and other local governments that I can share with you today, the state of our city is stronger than ever. Our region is buzzing about what we've accomplished together. Think about what we've done. We opened this amazing facility. We reconstructed our Orlando Citrus Bowl, secured a Major League Soccer team and broke ground on their stadium, added eight iconic sculptures downtown, kicked off Sunrail, and started planning a downtown UCF Valencia campus. The strength of our city, however, is more than just shiny buildings. It's about being named one of the top 10 cities of the future, being one of the nation's happiest cities in which to work, and being the friendliest city in Florida for small businesses. And it isn't just small businesses thriving here. Some of the world's most recognizable companies are choosing to call Orlando home. 
This is a direct result of our community following through on our vision to provide world-class amenities. And now we're seeing private investment flowing into our city and creating jobs. JetBlue opened a lodge at the airport where pilots and flight attendants come to get trained. Red Lobster relocated their headquarters right across the street in downtown. Ruby Tuesdays moving their key business operations to our city. The U.S. Tennis Association broke ground on its national campus, the new home of American tennis at Lake Nona. Orlando Health opened their 10-story North Tower. Florida Hospital is getting ready to open their new women's tower at Health Village. International Air Service has expanded to Dubai and Oslo and Havana. We've added more than 2,500 new housing units. And Orlando set the record for the most visitors with 62 million last year. And that spurred Universal Orlando to create 3,500 new jobs for our residents, which many of them are managerial, high-tech, or highly skilled. And we're building an innovation ecosystem where people can take their business concept from idea to reality. Because the next major company to have a headquarters in Orlando may still be an idea in an entrepreneur's head. In the past year, we've worked hard to bolster this ecosystem. The Church Street Exchange has gone from vacant to fully leased in a year, home to nearly 70 startups. It's become the living room of our growing tech community. The Orlando Tech Association continues to build and grow our tech industry and was just recognized by the White House for having the largest tech-focused meetup in the Southeast. And the city has partnered with UCF, Rollins, Canvas, and Starter Studio to create a seed fund that will provide critical capital to Orlando's most promising tech startups. And our efforts are working. Two of Orlando's startups, Code School and Pentaho, sold for nearly $600 million. Yeah, $600 million. And both started... <laughs> both started from scratch right here in Orlando and most importantly, the founders are committed to staying and growing in Orlando. And understand this, it's not just the past year that our city has focused on growing this industry. Shortly after I took office, we partnered with the state, UCF, and EA to create the Florida Interactive Entertainment Academy in what was then the vacant Expo Center. FIA is now the world's number two graduate school for game design. And building off FIA's success, we are working with UCF and Valencia to open a downtown campus at the Creative Village that will serve up to 13,000 students. It'll open up educational opportunities for all of our residents and provide best in the nation training for emerging animation, digital media, communications, film, and public affairs. This campus will change the landscape of Orlando forever. We created the Orlando Tech Association to build on the success of our main streets. Main streets are the economic engines of our neighborhoods. And we're seeing results. Walk or bike down Kareen or Mills or Edgewater. And you can feel the vibrancy throughout our main streets and into our neighborhoods. And if you haven't had a chance to visit, don't worry. You can read about them in things like the New York Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, the New Yorker, and even the wine enthusiast. <laughs> Main streets aren't just your favorite places to eat or shop. They're employment anchors for thousands of residents. We want Orlando to remain one of the best and least expensive places to launch a business. And now, we're making it easier for our contractors and small business owners to do business in Orlando. We're updating our development software to the latest cutting edge technology to provide easy tools to navigate our planning and permitting process. There's a reason Forbes recognized Orlando as the number one city in the country for job growth. And it's because we recognize that economic development doesn't just happen at City Hall, it happens when we listen 
to what our residents need and work with our private business and not-for-profits to impact our community. Commissioner Gray has seen this firsthand at the Medical City, where there's more than $3 billion and 7 million square feet of construction. The VA hospital, one of the Medical City's original anchor tenants, will open later this year. And this strategic growth means more high-quality jobs. And now, <clears throat> 400,000 veterans will have access to top-notch health care. I think we have some Marines in the house. <laughs> to ensure that local residents benefit from this investment, we've created the Orlando Medical Careers Program, which is an outgrowth from our successful Blueprint Program. The Blueprint Program has employed more than 3,000 Central Floridians from areas with historically high unemployment rates. Now, what have you told me? You've told me that sustainability is a priority for our community. Together with our partners, including and most especially OUC, we've developed a community action plan to help us build a sustainable city. As a government, we've been focused on saving money through energy efficiency, and we've reduced our energy cost in 24 buildings by 30%. And our private sector is following suit. Orlando now has more than 50 LEED certified or soon to be certified buildings. And to help our businesses go even further, last year we launched a commercial food waste collection pilot in three locations, diverting more than 175,000 pounds of food waste from our landfills. And our residents are also embracing the opportunities to keep our city green by making improvements to their homes and in their neighborhoods. Residential recycling participation is up by 10% year over year. We're working to turn our neighborhoods into eco-districts, where residents use resources more efficiently, invest in green buildings, and facilitate smarter infrastructure and transportation methods. Audubon Park Garden District and Richmond Heights are the first two neighborhoods working on this designation. Commissioner Sheehan and I brought sustainability efforts to your doorstep when we delivered residential composters. Already, we have 1,500 requests for composters that will divert more than 56 tons of food waste each month. And our community has come together and rallied around sustainability. And I can now declare that Orlando is the most sustainable city in the Southeast United States. But one thing is very clear when I talk to residents, they want to do more. We want to transform into one of the most sustainable cities in all of America. And here's our plan to get there. Investing in energy retrofits at more than 50 city facilities. And oh, by the way, these energy savings will help pay for nearly half the cost of the new police headquarters. We're expanding our multifamily recycling in our commercial composting program. Our city fleet will keep getting greener. This means less gas, less emissions, and less noise on our street. And we're going to increase the amount of trees we have in our city. A city full of trees provides not just beauty, but health benefits, economic value, and makes our city a cooler place to live. We want each and every resident, every one of you, to plant one new tree. And we're going to help you by kicking off our one person, one tree campaign later this year, and accomplishing that goal will increase our tree canopy from 25% to 40% by the year 2040. So being a sustainable city is also about enhancing and expanding our transportation options. Over the past couple of years, our entire region has collaborated on a plan to make getting around our community easier. It starts with the backbone of our new transit system, SunRail. On Friday, we will celebrate one year of SunRail, and I know it's been a success because people have stopped asking me, why do we need SunRail? 
And now they're asking, when are we going to expand to nights? When are we going to expand to weekends? When are we getting to Kissimmee? When are we getting to the airport? For SunRail to remain successful, riders must be able to easily connect to their final destination. Through a partnership with Lynx, we've added a new limo line, extended the original one, and will break ground next month on a third. And Friday, just in time for Bike to Work Day, we're expanding our bike share program. And even with just the 20 bikes we have so far, I'm seeing them all over downtown. As a matter of fact, bike share members have traveled over 2,600 miles. That's the equivalent of one person riding from here to LA. And through Orlando Walks, we'll be adding another 20 miles of sidewalks better connecting our city at more than 150 different sidewalk connections. And this adds to the 180 miles of sidewalk that we've added since I took office. We're working with our commissioners to enhance our major transportation corridors. Commissioner Ings has worked with our tourism partners and residents to overhaul North International Drive, making it easier and safer for all modes of transportation. And Commissioner Ortiz has worked with the Gateway Orlando Market Street to develop the Cimarron Boulevard Vision Plan. And as a result, we're seeing not just sidewalk and streetscape improvements, but more than $22 million in private investment. In Orlando, our roads should be focused on serving people, not just cars, which is why when we make transportation improvements, we're using the National Complete Streets model and treating all modes of transportation as equal. Biking and walking options aren't just about making it easy to get around, it's about making our city more livable. And we work every day to make our city more livable for everyone. And this commitment extends to the homeless individuals that you see on our streets day after day, particularly right here in our downtown core. And sadly, among these are men and women who have served our country and who now need our help. I'm proud that as a result of our regional partnerships, we have significant community momentum toward the effort to end veteran homelessness. In 2014, Orlando and Orange County were selected for the VA's 25 Cities Initiative and the Mayor's Challenge to End Veteran Homelessness. Recent numbers show that since 2011, Central Florida has seen a 57% reduction in total veteran homelessness, but we can do better. Our goal is to end veteran homelessness by the end of this year. And just like our community partnered on SunRail, on the development of the medical city, on the community venues, our region is working together like never before to end homelessness, both for chronic homeless individuals and homeless families. Through the Central Florida Commission on Homelessness, we're modeling the success of cities across the nation with the Housing First model. This approach houses people as quickly as possible and then surrounds them with the necessary services to keep them housed. Thanks in part to Florida Hospital, who made the largest one-time private commitment in the, our region's history to end chronic homelessness. Our community can hire case managers and provide essential services needed to keep homeless individuals off the street. Everyone deserves a place to call home. So not only is the housing first approach the right thing to do, it also saves our community money. It's a win-win and together we can end chronic homelessness in our city. <clears throat> our partnerships with the community continue to help us solve tough problems, but they also help us to solve and prevent crime. And I am pleased to report that as Orlando continues to grow, we continue to grow safer. Crime has gone down six of the last seven years, and that equates to a nearly 20% decrease since 2007. In 2014, we had the same number of homicides as we did in 1969, 
and that was when we had a population of less than 100,000 people. This success reflects the excellence of our police department, one of the nation's finest. In fact, OPD's homicide solve rate is 88%. That's 25% higher than the national average. And yes, they solve crimes, but it's what they do to prevent crimes from ever happening that makes our community safer. Crime reduction efforts focus on outreach, where officers go out into the community and develop relationships with our residents. They participate in programs like youth basketball leagues, which have helped reduce juvenile crime by 50%. They walk along residential streets, encouraging people to lock their cars and homes. Simple, right? It's an effort led by Commissioner Stewart, helping to reduce residential burglaries by 27% this last year. The cop on the beat still works. And our police headquarters, which is scheduled to open next year, will bring OPD even closer to the community. It's designed to make interacting with our officers easier. But for this kind of community policing to work, there must be mutual respect and trust between officers and residents. We count on the support of our citizens, and we know our officers must earn your confidence. We take it very seriously when someone from our department violates that trust. And as most of you are aware, that has happened of late. And we have responded. Severe disciplinary action has been taken against officers accused of excessive force. One has been terminated and another suspended. Both are facing criminal charges. We have no qualms about turning over such incidents to FDLE or the state attorney's office for investigation. We respect and honor our police officers, but we also hold them accountable to the highest professional standards. We have seen on a national level what happens when divides form between police and communities, and it is important that we take proactive measures to ensure that that doesn't happen here. And that's why I have charged Byron Brooks, our chief administrative officer, who was born and raised in Orlando and has deep community ties to work with Police Chief John Mita to lead a department and community effort to address these issues. This will include ensuring our officers are equipped with the latest tools and technology to fight crime, completing a thorough review of our policies, engaging third parties from UCF to FDLE to ensure accountability and best practices, launching community outreach programs like the Chief's Community Leadership Academy, and implementing and enhancing our training programs, and deploying body cams to provide critical evidence in solving crimes, increasing transparency and accountability, and to strengthen the trust with our community. We can't let the actions of a few taint the reputation of a department that serves this community with compassion and courage every day under conditions that most of us can't imagine. I know that our OPD officers support these efforts, and I thank them for the job that they do every day protecting our community. I am so proud to be mayor of such an inclusive city. Diversity is our greatest strength. Our city has festivals and events that celebrate almost every culture in the world. And it's through initiatives like our OLA office, which offers bilingual services and referrals to Hispanic residents and newcomers, that we're able to serve our diverse residential population. And being mayor, I get to do a lot of cool things. But one of the more meaningful days since my time in office was marrying 44 same-sex couples at City Hall. And I know this to be true. Being an inclusive city is just not the right thing to do. It secures our economic future, and it makes us a more interesting and dynamic city. Being a city for everyone means continuing to be a great place to raise a family 
And that starts with providing the best education options in the nation. It's why our after-school programs go beyond sports activities and provide mentoring and tutoring. It's why we work closely with OCPS to build neighborhood schools, including our new Paramore Pre-K through 8. It's why through our Orlando CARES program that we're increasing youth literacy and providing hands-on education opportunities, guiding students to graduation. And it's why we launched Stand Up Orlando to help prevent bullying. Being a city for everyone means providing our residents access to affordable and safe housing. Recently, the city purchased seven foreclosed apartment complexes in the Lake Sunset and Clear Lake and Mercy Drive neighborhoods that were vacant and boarded up. Our community has come together and formed a public-private partnership called Lift Orlando to transform these eyesores into safe and attractive housing, uplifting all of our west side neighborhoods. And our heroes deserve affordable housing options too. Through a partnership with the Florida Real Estate Foundation, we will redevelop six lots at Jefferson Park into single family homes for veterans and local law enforcement officers as part of our Heroes Commons project. Later today, I'll join Commissioner Hill and we will break ground on the first home. Being a city for everyone means adding even more amenities to our neighborhood parks and community centers including renovating our neighborhood center computer labs like we did at the Smith Center, adding a paddleboard and canoe launch at Lake Ivanhoe, enhancing Lock Haven Cultural Park through new wayfinding sidewalks in a plaza, and adding an exercise trail around the Park of the Americas and renovating our playgrounds. Okay, so there's one group that's been barking that Orlando needs to be dog friendly. <laughs> so enough is enough. And this year, we opened our first off-the-leash dog park at Park of the Americas. I hope you'll visit there, or very soon, we will add a pop-up dog park in downtown. We're able to tout all of these achievements I've been talking about today because of the dedicated team working at our city, a team that fills 90% of potholes within 24 hours a team that handles half a million trash pickups each week, of which 99.98% are on time, and I'll concede that's a heck of a lot better than my success rate when it comes to taking out the trash at home. <laughs> so now when you find those potholes or you have a question about trash pickup, we're gonna make it easier for you to interact with us. Soon you'll be able to use the Orlando Connects app to report issues and ask questions. As a 21st century city, it should be as easy to report a pothole as it is to buy diapers on Amazon. It is through our strong leaders that we continue to look for ways to improve services and come, become more efficient. Our new Orlando Fire Chief, Roderick Williams, knows firsthand about quality and efficient service. The number of accreditations that our fire department has could probably fill a speech all by itself. It puts them in the top 1% of fire departments in the entire country. And now they're working with OPD on a new joint dispatch technology to respond even faster to our residents. And maybe most importantly, we do all this on sound financial footing. We've maintained our AAA credit rating with Fitch, the highest rating available, and we can stand with any city in the country when it comes to being fiscally responsible. All right, you know that I don't like to give long speeches, but even with one this long, we have struggled to fit every success in that we've had over the past year. We live in a special city, in a special time, and this is because of people like you that are here today. And I would like to specifically recognize again our city council members, our city staff, our partners at Orange, Seminole, Osceola, and Lake County, 
Our business and community leaders and our residents, each and every one of you helps us create a city that is recognized throughout the world. Our community's shared vision allows us to work together to get things done. And today, that puts our city at a remarkable point in our history. But just imagine where we'll be next year or 10 years from now as we shape our city for generations ahead. I feel like my journey here is not done yet. There is so much more that we can accomplish together, but I can promise you this. My passion for Orlando is larger today than it's ever been. And it's for that reason I'll be running for another term as your mayor. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless America and God bless the city of Orlando.